else do we need? All right, let's see. Remarks on the homework coming back. Uh, a couple of quick things. Uh, let's see, this was section 13. In question 8, that's the one about uh, phi of g is g inverse. Is this or is this not a homomorphism? And if it's not, tell me when it might be. Uh, some of you said, well, in one case you get essentially G1 inverse G2 inverse, in the other case you get G2 inverse G1 inverse, and some of you just said, therefore it's not a homomorphism. Well, if it's not, give me a counterexample. If you can tell me something's not true, then convince me it's not true. I mean, sometimes it is true. Uh, let's see, did I have another comment on that? No. Uh, on number 47, that's the one with the order of the group is a prime. Convince me that any homomorphism from that group is either one to one or the trivial homomorphism. Most all of you had the right idea. What I was a little bit concerned with, though, is stylistically you were writing some very imprecise proofs. For example, I saw some of this. Therefore, kernel of phi is one or p. In fact, this, that makes no sense. It's apples and oranges. This is a subgroup. That's a number. You can't have a number equaling a subgroup. That makes no sense. I sort of knew what you meant. You meant that, but you didn't say that. Okay. Similarly, what some of you would use is the article it, and therefore it is one, or it is one to one, or it is trivial, or it I don't know what the heck it is. There's so many it's here, like it could be a function, it could be a subgroup, it could be the number of elements in the subgroup. So there were a lot of things. So if you're going to use this word, well, it's best to never use this word in mathematics. Just tell me what it is. Is it the function? Is it the subgroup? Is it the number of elements in the subgroup, et cetera? Okay. So this was all just sort of style. But the style was ungood in many situations. So please be careful. Okay? And uh, the last, and this is clearly a style comment, but um, we talk about homomorphisms. Homomorphisms. A homomorphism is a function. So phi is a homomorphism. We're eventually going to talk about the notion of two groups being isomorphic. And what some of you were doing is putting this one here and this one here. You talked about a homomorphic. Homomorphic is mm, it's just not a good word. So if you used homomorphic, I mean, we talk about homomorphic images, but we're not going to talk about that in here. So. If you're going to use homomorphism, it's ism, and it, re and it uh, corresponds to the function itself. When we talk about isomorphisms, we'll do that today. That's going to be a good word. And two groups being isomorphic, that's going to be a good word. But homomorphic is usually just, it's just not a good word. At least we won't have chance to use it in this particular course. Okay. All right, so please be a little bit more careful with your language, your style here. All right, uh, I want to look ahead a little bit. So let me tell you how things will play out, at least as far as the timing goes, and then we're going to take a vote in here tonight. Uh, essentially, the material that we'll finish up tonight will be the last material that will appear on exam two. So tonight we're going to do uh, chapter 15 or section 15 and then we're going to go back and pick up some ideas in section 3 and that'll be the material through uh, exam 2. I had listed on the sheet that I handed out on day 1 exam 2 is happening a week from Wednesday that's October 24th. Here's the way that the homework will um, yeah here's the way the, the homework will be scheduled. The assignment that I'm going to give you tonight 
will essentially just cover the stuff that we do tonight and a little bit of the stuff that we did last Wednesday. So this will be a relatively short assignment that I'm going to give you tonight. You have an assignment due Wednesday that you'll get back next Monday. The one I'm going to give you tonight will be due on a short turnaround time. It will be due next Monday instead of the usual rhythm of next Wednesday. All right, so everything that will be on exam two you will have seen through tonight and you will have done a homework assignment on and turn it in next Monday. So the question is, do you want to have that exam that Wednesday or do you want to put exam two off till the following Monday so that you might have time to digest that last homework assignment or not? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't really matter. But let's go ahead and vote. So the vote will either be that we'll have exam two on the day it was originally scheduled for, either Wednesday, October 4th, uh, 24th, sorry, October 24, or Monday, October 29. Okay, anybody want to ask any questions before we vote here? Okay, again, the, the stuff that'll be on this exam will essentially be through tonight, and you'll have a homework assignment due on it due next Monday on a short turnaround schedule and we can certainly have the exam Wednesday or following Monday. So here we go. How many would prefer it on Wednesday the 24th? Raise your hands relatively high. One, two, three, four, five, six. How about Monday the 29th? Oh yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, so officially we'll have it here. I will hand out exam review materials possibly this Wednesday, but definitely by next Monday the 22nd. So you'll have those in hand for at least a week and we'll be able to put together some SI stuff and various and sundry other things. Okay, let me write that down here. October 29th. All right. Okay. So here's some, um, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes or so, finishing up some of the ideas that we saw in section 15. What we were doing was looking at the structure of certain, excuse me, of certain factor groups. And so the idea was last time looked at uh, given a group G and a normal subgroup of G, or H normal and G, form G, sometimes we say G slash H or G mod H or the factor group of G by H. There's lots of different ways of describing that particular group. What is it? It's the group of cosets, group of cosets of H in G. So the elements of this group are inherently sets. They're the cosets of H and G and we know how to combine them. We have a couple of different ways of viewing what that combination process looks like. You can either view it as just set multiplication, in other words, set combination, or you can view it as AH star BH is ABH and we're guaranteed that that's well defined. What I want to do tonight is uh, a few more computations with these particular types of groups. So example, uh, let's look at the following. Let's take G to be the group Z3 cross Z4. So here's a group. And we'll look at the subgroup generated by uh, 1 comma 2. Let's see if I want to do that. Nope. Uh, zero comma two, pardon me. So let's see what the subgroup looks like in here. It's, well, you can always, when you're looking at the cyclic subgroup, write down the identity element of the group. Then you write down the element itself, that's zero comma two. And then you write down the element star with itself. Well, zero two added to zero two is what? Well, zero, zero. So we already get zero, zero back, so there is the subgroup. So now we can form, since H is normal in G, let's see, how do I know that H is normal in G automatically? Why? What do I know about G? G 
these abelian, and we know that any subgroup of an abelian group is necessarily normal. So I don't really even have to worry about writing out all the cosets. I know automatically H is normal in G. So I'll put in parentheses since G is abelian. All this does for me, folks, is it guarantees that I don't have to sit down and check that the left cosets are the right cosets. Or I don't have to check that G inverse HG is an H. Comes for free, comes automatically. All right, we can form, form the factor group G slash H. And what I want to do is practice looking at the orders of various elements inside G slash H. So example, uh, find, here's an element, here is an element in the group G slash H. And what I'm getting you used to here, folks, is thinking the things inside the factor group are cosets. So when I write down an element, what I'm about to write down is a coset of H sitting in G. Well, here is H. If you want, I could write it out, but it's easier just to call it H because that's what it is. And what I need to do is star that thing or form the coset with, I don't know, I'm just going to pick an element. How about uh, 1, 2? Now this is a little bit new tonight. Typically what we've been doing is just writing the element of the group next to the subgroup or in some instances we've been writing little g star h. But in a situation where the uh, binary operation in the given group is usually denoted by a plus, it's typical or it's common to denote the coset by using the plus notation because that's how you go ahead and build the coset. You take whatever the element of the group is and now you're going to combine it with, well here the operation in the given group happens to be addition, you're going to combine it with everything in the subgroup. So here is a coset. Now what I could do is write it out. Let's see, if I wrote out this coset, it's you simply combine this thing with everything in the subgroup, so I get 1, 2, and let's see what else is in the subgroup. 1, 2 plus 0, 2 gives what? 1, 0. So there it is. Now, the following question is reasonable find the order of this element. Order of this element in the group G slash H. Now let me sort of preclude a possible question and hopefully steer you correctly on the types of homework questions that will come up on the stuff that I give you tonight. This word order is a little bit unfortunate. We've wrestled with the issues surrounding this word before. Order, on the surface, means two things. If you drill down a little bit deeper, the two things turn out to be identical. But order either means how many elements are in the set, or it means if you've got an element inside a group, it means if you take that element and you start doing the binary operation to itself, how many times does it take you to get back to the identity element of the group? All right. Well, look, I'm asking you for the order of an element. So the way I've asked the question, I've asked you to tell me how do you, well, I've asked you to interpret the word order in that second meaning. I've got some element of a group. Just take the thing and keep combining it with itself until you get to the identity. Here's what students often uh, the, the misinterpret that word as. As soon as you see this, you're thinking, oh, how many elements are in some set? And what's unfortunate in this particular context is the element that you're looking at is a set. So what students tend to do is say, oh, the order is two because I'm looking at a set with two elements. Not the correct interpretation. You're supposed to view this thing as an element inside some group. OK, I can do that. And now find its order, i.e., you know, how many times does it take? Times does it take to what? To take the given element to uh, perform the binary operation, the uh, binary operation. Well, what's the binary operation? It's the binary operation in this group, in G slash H, on the element 1, 2 plus H, until we see the identity element. We see the identity element of the group of G slash H. Well, I know what the identity element of, of the factor group is. In any factor group, it's always you take the identity of the group and you add it to the 
subgroup. In other words, the identity element is always the subgroup itself. Identity is always just H in G slash H. So what we're asked to do here is take this particular element, start combining it with itself, and keep going until we see the identity element. So let's go ahead and do that. So I take 1, 2 plus H, and I combine it with itself. There's a lot of pluses happening here. This is the plus happening inside G. This is what's allowing you to form this coset. There's that same coset. Of course, it's just an element of the factor group. This plus is the binary operation inside the factor group. So I'm asking you to combine that coset to that coset. So how do you do that? Well, I know the definition of the operation inside the factor group. You simply combine the two coset representatives. Now here, the two coset representatives happen to be the same element. So that makes the computation a little bit easier. Let's see, if I add this to that, I get 2 inside Z3. If I add this to that, I get 4 inside Z4, which is 0. So here's the question. Is this equal to H? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's 2, 0. If I take 2, 0 plus 0, 0, I get 2, 0. If I take 2, 0, then this gives what? 2, 2. So that's not equal to H. So what this says is that the order of that element is not 2 because I combined it with itself and I didn't get the identity. Let's try another one. How about 1, 2, here it is. But this is going to get tedious, as you can see. 1, 2, plus H. Let's do it three times. I mean, I'm writing this out just for emphasis. This is what the question is asking you to do. It has nothing to do with how many elements are in the coset itself. Equals what? Well, let's see, I already did this chunk of it in the previous line, so let's use that information. That's 2, 0, plus H plus, so I've combined these already, folks. Just take the information that you've already learned in the previous line. Plus 1, 2, plus H. Hmm. And so what do I get? Well, you combine the cosets, and you get 2, comma, 1. Oh, but wait, I'm sorry, 2 plus 1, but 2 plus 1 is happening inside Z3. So I get, in the first coordinate, 0 because that's 2 plus 1 happening inside Z3. And the second coordinate I get 0 comma 2, or 0 plus 2, which is 2 plus H. Is that H? Mm -hmm. Equals H. A couple ways I know that. One is just pound it out. Take 0, 2, and add to everything in H. You'll get 0, 2, plus you'll get 0, 2, and then here you'll get 0, 0. So you get, admittedly, in different order, but order doesn't matter, because all we're worried about is this thing as a set. You'll simply get, if you pound this thing out, H. Or, the approach I'd prefer you to take is, this is in the subgroup. And whenever you have something that's already in the subgroup, it plus the subgroup has to be the subgroup again. Okay, so by, by default, as soon as I see an element as the coset representative that already lives in the subgroup, I'm done. Okay, so now let's answer the question because we've got enough information to. So what is the order of this element? What did I start with? One, comma, two. Is what? Three. Why? Because I took the thing and I combined it with itself twice. In other words, I did it plus it, and I didn't get the identity of the, of the group, but then I combined it with itself three times, and I did get the identity of the group. Okay. You might say, but there's only two elements in there. Yeah, so? But I already knew that. I knew that way back when, three weeks ago. If the question was, how many elements are in this coset, the answer is two for every coset that you pick because any two cosets have the same number of elements and they have the same number of elements as H but that's not the question that's being asked here. Alright, questions? Comments? Diana, question. How did you get up there H equals 
Oh, how did I get from here to here? Yeah. Um, it's sub, by definition, H is the subgroup generated by that element. So by definition, you write down the identity, and then you write down the element itself, and then you keep going. But when we kept going, if we did 0, 2, and added it to itself, that was already 0, 0, so we were done. Other questions, comments? Yeah, Lindsay, question. And H, and GH is H, that's just a, is that always true? That's always true. Yeah, this is true for any, yeah. true, yeah, for any factor group in any, because remember, um, when we proved that G slash H is a group, the identity element looked like that, E-H. E was the identity of the group. Technically, there's whatever the binary operation is in here, but we sort of quit putting that down. But in the end, when you do EH, you always just get H back because E is already in the subgroup. So do we have to do all of the, can we just show the elements like the 1, 2, with itself, like the truth that we can only just, only have to do just the 1, 2 over there? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. And the answer is... <laughs> That's a great question. Here's why. Okay, so here's a good aha moment. I think if I understand the question correctly, you know, you can ask, pick just that yeah, and ask for its order. So here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to write this down, but I'm going to talk through it. So Lindsay's question is, well, just find the order of that. Right? Okay, well, what is the order of this inside G? Well, if I add it to itself, I get 2 comma 0. If I add it to itself again, I get 0 comma 2. I don't get 0, 0. Ooh. If I add it to itself again, it turns out that thing inside G has order 6. So the punchline is no. If you can compute or you somehow know or you're interested in the order of the coset representative sitting inside the original group, we could work for another two weeks and come up with some convoluted formula that tells you what the order of the element in the factor group is compared to what the order of the element in the original group is. But no, they're definitely not the same. This one has order 6 in G, but that has order 3 in G mod H. Yeah. So be careful here, folks. You absolutely do need to drag this H along here in general. Because here, you know, as I just mentioned, this thing sitting by itself in G has order 6, but this thing is an element of the factor group only has order 3. Turns out the order can only go down. It can't ever go up. If you have an element of order something, order, order, order P or something like that, P is bad, order R inside the group G, then the order of the element has to not only go down, but has to actually be a divisor of the original one. But it's, it's just not worth the effort to try to figure out what the exact relationship is. Yeah, Susan. Um, along that same line, could you just take the 1, 2 and combine it with itself until you get an element in H? Yes. So the answer to that question is yes. So Susan's question is, suppose you wanted to somehow compute the order of the element in the factor group, could you do it by just considering uh, computations involving the element inside the original group? And the answer is yes, and it boils down to how many whacks does it take, not for this thing to necessarily become 0, 0, but simply to wind up with something in the subgroup. Yeah, yeah exactly right. It can be any, say, H had five elements in it. It can be just the first one that you get. The first one you get is all you need. Because any element inside H, I don't care what it's called, is going to generate the same coset as EH because the two live in the same coset to begin with. So, so yeah, if, if you wanted computationally, what you could do is simply say, all right, take this thing, keep beating on it until you see something inside the subgroup. And that's exactly what happened here. It took three whacks to get something inside the subgroup, so it's orders three. Kind of like that. Good. So, I mean, this is a great example to write out just to indicate that we're not looking at the number of elements in the coset or anything like that. It's simply the same definition of order as we've always been used to. It's just now the computation is a little bit more cumbersome because you, now you're taking a coset and you're combining with itself. Okay. 
Now there's still some, I mean there's some arithmetic that we still know that's still perfectly valid in these cosets because these coset groups are just groups. For example, let's see, I know how many elements are in this group. The coset group G slash H, the original group G has 12. The subgroup happens to have two elements. So the number of cosets, so what we call the index of G and H is 12 divided by 2, which is 6. So if I were to write out all the elements of the factor group G slash H, I'd be looking at six elements, I'm a group of six elements. So hey, if I have a group of six elements, what does Lagrange's theorem say? It says that if you're computing the order of any element, that number has to divide six. So at least the number that we got here you know, did, satisfies that possibility. Remark, if I had taken an element and I had combined it with itself twice and didn't see the identity, or three times and didn't see the identity, in fact, I'm done because the order of the element has to divide six. And if it's not one, two, or three, then the answer is six. So, you know, you might want to play those sort of Lagrange guarantee games when you're doing the homework, saying, all right, I'm beating on this thing, da, 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 I'm already past a certain point. Therefore, by the theory, I can conclude that the order is something, maybe six here. Let's just make sure by continuing to pound things out that it actually agrees with what I get in my computation. So that might be a good way to convince yourself that you're doing the correct sort of computations here. All right. Good one. Other questions, comments? Okay. Let me show you a slight shorthand notation. If you're comfortable with it, go ahead and use it. If you're not comfortable with it, you can continue to use this sort of coset notation. Rather than continuing to write out something like that as the coset, Sometimes what we'll do is simply write, sometimes written as just G with a line over it. So for instance here, when we were talking about the element 1, 2 plus H um, can be written as you just take the element 1, 2 with a line over it. And the interpretation is that the subgroup's been determined. It doesn't change throughout the discussion. You've written it down somewhere. It's understood what the subgroup is. And the line simply means you're taking this element and you're writing down the coset that it represents. So that when you start doing the computations, So, okay, so this is this coset combined with this coset. Well, I know how to do that. It's the coset 2 comma 0. Why? Because the computation of combining cosets is you simply take whatever the coset representatives are and you do the combination in there. And here, because I'm adding in uh, Z4 in the second component, this just turns out to be 2, 0 bar. Of course, you know, I can write out what that is, and we wrote that down over there. It turned out to be 2, 0 comma 2, 2. Whether or not that particular coset is of interest to me. It probably isn't. Typically all I'm interested in is whether or not I'm looking at the identity, which is easy to determine in this case. It's simply a matter of deciding whether or not the element that you've cranked out there is in the subgroup. Okay. So that's just some notation. You'll typically see that. I think the author of this text uses it relatively often. But it, at least when I was learning this stuff, I was just more comfortable pulling the, this old notation along because it sort of kept front and center what it is I was working with, working with cosets. All right, you've got to be a little more careful, and the computation is a little more cumbersome, but we can at least come with this thing. Okay. All right, good question so far. Other questions, comments? All right, let's see. Yeah, so the examples, all of the examples that I've written down so far of a group and a normal subgroup and then the formation of the corresponding group of cosets or factor groups, whichever notation or verbiage you prefer, has always started with the group G being a finite group. But all the computations and definitions that we've made for computations inside these coset groups are perfectly valid even if the group is infinite. And in fact, there's a very important example of a situation where you write down an infinite group and a subgroup of it, which also happens to be infinite, 
where when you look at the factor group, you actually get a finite group, and you actually get a group that's relatively familiar or something that we'll be able to recognize right away. So here's an example of the situation where g is infinite. g is infinite is perfectly valid. Still is OK as far as forming factor groups go. It's forming factor groups. The issue is the same. You start with a group G. You write down a subgroup of it. You have to make sure the subgroup is normal, but the definition of normal doesn't depend on whether or not the group is finite or infinite or anything like that. And then form G slash H. Here's a good example. Example, your favorite infinite group, the group of integers. Of course, under addition, that's the only legit binary operation that turns this particular set into a group. Obviously, there's infinitely many things in there. Let's look at a subgroup. How about H is the subgroup? Cook one up. 4Z, so the multiple is a 4. Let's see, the group is abelian, because it's just the integers under addition. So any subgroup, and we prove that if you hand me any fixed integer, here I've handed you four, that the collection of all multiples of it is a subgroup. So that's not an issue. We learned that, I don't know, a month ago or so. Because that's abelian, this is by default normal. So H is normal in G. Making that look a little bit nicer. H is normal in G. So we can form the factor group, G slash H. Now all sort of numerical bets are off here. If you want to somehow interpret the number of elements in here as infinity divided by infinity or something like that. But it turns out there's only going to be four elements in there. I'll tell you what they are. Let's see. Here's a coset. The coset consisting of the subgroup itself. Well, there's the identity element of the group. So if I look at the coset consisting of itself, I just get well, 4z. I just get the subgroup back. Here's another coset. Yeah, it's, you know, add 1 to everything in the subgroup. So it's, you know, 1, 5, 9, I don't know, minus 3, minus 7, blah, 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 blah. It's certainly a whole lot more convenient to write it that way. That's perfectly good notation. It's just a coset. Here's another coset. Here's another coset. That's all the cosets. How do I know that? Because I've captured every possible integer by writing down these four subsets. Every integer is, it is either a multiple of four or one more than a multiple of four or two more than a multiple. Okay, so let's see. So I have this group. Group's got four elements. Here's a reasonable notation for the elements in this group. Instead of calling it 0 plus h and 1 plus h, let's use this bar notation. So these are each individually infinite sets. They are these cosets. But wait a minute, I know that regardless of whether they're finite or infinite, it makes no difference. It happens to be finite and there's only four of them that this process forms a group. Hey, I can write out the group table. Let's see, 0 plus 0, 0 bar, 1 bar, 2 bar. Now the first row and the first column of a group table is always easy because you're just combining 0. All right, let's do some more. How about 1 bar plus 1 bar? That's easy, that's 2 bar because I'm just combining 1 with 1. And let's see, 1 bar plus 2 bar is 3 bar. And how about 1 bar plus 3 bar? Zero bar. The reason being, if I simply do the computation, one plus three, I get four. And the question is, which coset does four represent? Answer, it's that one because four is in here. Hmm. Let's do another one. Let's see, two bar plus one bar is three bar. Two bar plus two bar is four bar, which is zero bar. Here's a little more interesting one. 2 bar plus 3 bar. You want to say, well, 2 plus 3 is 5. So that's 5 bar. 
But where does 5 bar live? Right there. It's the same as 1 bar. Hmm. 0 bar, 1 bar, 2 bar. So there's the group table for this group that has four elements. Does that look familiar? Yeah, what group does it look like? How about that one? Group with four elements? Is it cyclic? Yeah, let's see. If I look at zero bar, if I look at one bar, one bar plus one bar, two bar plus one bar, so there is the subgroup generated by is all of G slash H. So what we've shown is if we take the group G and the subgroup 4Z, uh, G, G is Z and the subgroup H is 4Z, and we form the factor group that what we get a group is a group that walks and talks like Z4, we get a cyclic group having four elements in it. Here's a generator. It turns out 3 is also a generator, 3 bar, but in order to verify that this group is cyclic, suffices to just write down a generator, and that's easy to do. One bar works. And so let's see if we can together come to this sort of general conclusion based on this particular example. And I won't run through the details in general, but in general, if I start with this group, if G is the group of integers under addition, and H is the subgroup NZ, so multiples of this fixed integer N, maybe N's 4, 10, or 2, I don't know, just tell me what you want it to be, then this group, the group of cosets of NZ sitting inside Z, it turns out there are N elements in that group. 0 bar, 1 bar, 2 bar, up through n minus 1 bar, and this thing is, in fact, cyclic with n elements. It has n elements in exactly the same way that z slash 4z had four elements. You simply write out the numbers 0 through n minus 1, and that will generate all the possible cosets, because then things cycle back. It's cyclic because it'll always be the case that if you look at one bar, well, one bar plus one bar is two bar, which in turn gives three bar, et cetera, and you wind up generating all the elements in here. And in fact, i.e., this thing, z slash nz, is isomorphic to, well, hey, as soon as I've told you that you've got a cyclic group and I've told you how many elements are in it, zn. What was this? This is the number 0 through n minus 1 with addition mod n. So in effect, mod n arithmetic is really nothing more than manipulating cosets. It's just we prefer, I don't say we prefer, it's easier to manipulate the numbers 0 through n minus 1 and simply interpret what the operation is as mod n. But the way that most authors will phrase this is if you're interested in the group with n elements, that is cyclic, in other words, a cyclic group of n elements, typically it's presented this way first, but most authors would view this as what they'd call the elegant way to construct a cyclic group with n elements. You take the cyclic group having infinitely many elements and you look at the factor group by another subgroup having, well, infinitely many elements, but you simply look at the multiples of n. Okay. One final sort of philosophical comment about this and then we'll Look at another quick example of an infinite group. Intuitively, here's what you're doing, folks. When you form the factor group, so G slash H, the identity element of the factor group is H itself. That's E, right? or E bar, or whatever you want to call it. Any element that's in the subgroup then generates the identity element of the factor group. So whether you want to look at zero bar, or in that situation that we looked at in the first example, zero comma two bar, as long as you have something in the subgroup, it is the identity element of the factor group. And at least if the operation is written as an addition, the identity element is typically you know, interpreted as zero. So the intuition is if you 
take a subgroup, then forming the factor group in effect makes everything in the subgroup tantamount to zero. So if you're going to form something like z slash 4z, then what you've essentially done is ask me to take anything that's in the subgroup and view it as zero. You know, it's make 4 zero, make 8 zero. Yeah, and that's precisely what's happening when you do this sort of operation. 4 becomes zero, 8 becomes zero. So if you ever look at 4 or 8 or 12 or negative 4, etc., you're treating it just as if it was zero to begin with, because that's the identity element of your addition. All right. Hey, that's all mod n arithmetic does. You view n as zero. All right. Uh, let me just sneak this final comment in about factor groups for infinite groups. Uh, we can talk about factor groups for infinite groups even if the infinite group isn't abelian. Let me give you one important example of where that happens. Another example is the group is this thing that we call GLNR. It's the collection of n by n matrices with entries in the real numbers whose determinant is not zero. So n by n matrices with non-zero determinant. Here is a subgroup. We call it SLNR, but let me just write it out this way. It's the elements of GLNR, so the matrices in G with the property that the determinant of the matrix is 1. So if I look inside the general linear group, if I look inside the collection of matrices having non-zero determinant, which under matrix multiplication we've shown to be a group, if I look at this subset, we know how to show that H is a subgroup. H is a subgroup of G. See, essentially, exam one. Although I, that was a bigger than sign, but it turns out. So roughly exam one, or it looks like a homework. We know how to show this. It's just subgroup theorem. It's pretty straightforward. Actually, in fact, H is actually a normal subgroup of G. That's a little bit trickier, but Typically, if you're asked to show something's a normal subgroup, it's not necessarily the only thing to do, but typically you run for that one equivalent condition on the list that asks you to compute G inverse HG for everything in the subgroup and see whether or not you get something back in the subgroup. How do we show this? Reason, let's see. If I take something in the group, let's call it little g, and I take something in the subgroup, and I take something in the group, and I compute G inverse HG, where this is in G, and this is in the subgroup H. So let's see, what does this mean? This means that G has non-zero determinant. That's what puts it in the group. H has determinant 1. And what we're asking is whether or not when we perform this, whether we get something back in H. In other words, where the result gives us determinant 1. So let's compute its determinant. Determinant of G inverse HG, math 313. It's the determinant of G inverse times the determinant of H times the determinant of G, because determinant is multiplicative. Oh, but wait a minute. This is 1 over determinant of G. That's also math 313 result times, oh, determinant of H, if H is in the subgroup, then its determinant is 1. That's convenient. So I get 1 over determinant G times determinant of G, which is 1. Check. So this thing, G inverse HG, is in fact in the subgroup. So what does it mean? It means then we can form G slash H. And this is a really interesting group, but we're not going to spend any additional time picking it apart. All right. Oh, for what it's worth, this group, that's infinite. There's certainly infinitely many matrices having non-zero determinant coefficients and reals. Uh, there's infinitely many matrices having determinant 1, so each is infinite. And when you form the factor, unlike what happened when we did z slash 4z, this is still infinite. So it turns out you can't list out all the corresponding segments. Well, question. I was just going to ask that the determinants, when the determinants not one, you're not going to multiply it to some of the 
Let's see. Ask it again. I was just asking you just pointed out. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, so so the question becomes how many different cosets are there? And it turns out there'll be a coset I gotta be careful here. Uh, we know how to determine when two elements of a group determine different cosets. You have to determine whether or not A, B inverse is in the subgroup. And so it turns out it's relatively easy to write down infinitely many different cosets because all you have to do is, for instance, take two and a bunch of ones and zeros everywhere else. There's a matrix. It'll generate a coset. And then if you change the matrix to a three and ones and zeros and then four and five, so it turns out for every real number, if I put it in a one one slot and a bunch of ones and zeros everywhere else, that those will generate different cosets for this particular subgroup. Not that that's all of them, but at least there's a relatively easy way to show that there are infinitely many of them. Are there uncountably many? Are there uncountably many? There are uncountably many. There are uncountably many, yeah. There's at least as many as are. So. All right. So before we start, uh, yeah, I'll spend the last 15 minutes talking about isomorphisms tonight. But this is a good time to talk about a, a really big problem that was around in, in algebra that I can now state for you relatively easily, because you've now got the background and the verbiage to get there whose solution is I mean, a really, I think, sort of monumental achievement in mathematics and is an achievement that was completed within the last 20 years or so. So here's the word. Um, definition. Definition is this. Um, a group G is called, this is an interesting word to use, simple in case the only normal subgroups, subgroups of G are the trivial ones, plus E and G. Let's see, we know if we start with any group that not only do we always have the two trivial subgroups, those are always subgroups, in fact it was totally trivial to notice that not only are these subgroups, they're actually normal subgroups. So if I hand you any group, and it's not just the group consisting of one element, there's always inside that group two normal subgroups. For some groups, that's all the normal subgroups. For other groups, there are additional normal subgroups. And here's a big question. Question? Find examples of simple groups. Well, one type of example is totally easy. Answer one, Z sub P where P is prime. Sort of a cheating example. Here's why. Let's see, can I prove that the only normal subgroups of this group are E and G? Yeah, because we actually proved that the only subgroups, period, of ZP are the identity, of, the identity subgroup in P itself. That was Lagrange's theorem. So in fact, this word never even came into play. If the only subgroups are E and G, then those are the only normal subgroups. So the question is, are there any more interesting examples of groups that have the property that if you hunt around inside them, that the only normal subgroups are the identity subgroup and the group itself, the answer turns out to be yes. If you look inside S5, the subgroup that we called A5, the collection of even permutations on the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, turns out to be a group. It's a group of 60 elements. It's half of 5 factorial. And it turns out and this result's not beyond the scope of this course, but would take us an extra lecture to show why it's true. This turns out to be simple. It turns out there are actually many, many subgroups of A5. 
just take any element and look at the subgroup it generates. You don't get all 85. So there's a whole lot of subgroups, but you can actually show that none of those subgroups are normal. Even if you look at some of the you know, subgroups that don't just look like subgroups generated by various elements, none of them are normal. It's an interesting result. There's another one around there. It turns out, in fact, A6 is also simple. A4 is not simple. It turns out the group consisting of the even permutations on the set 1 through 4, it's a non-abelian group with 12 elements, but it's not simple. You can find a normal subgroup in there. But somehow the difference between A4 and A5 is dramatic. There are normal subgroups of A4, there are no normal subgroups of A5. And when I say that, folks, I mean no normal subgroups other than the ones that you have to have. Or A6, or in fact, if you look at the collection of even permutations on any set 1 through n, as long as n is bigger than or equal to 5, you get a simple group. Now, a quick comment about why these should be simple. In effect, folks, the idea is this. If you hand me a group that's not simple, in other words, if you hand me a group that has a normal subgroup, then the intuitive idea is you can then form or consider two groups. You can consider the subgroup itself. It's a group. But if the subgroup is normal in the group, then you can also consider the factor group, G slash H. So what you've done is you've taken the group G, and I don't know what a good phrase is, maybe trade in. You sort of traded in the group G for the two smaller groups, H and G slash H. And they're each smaller because if this is a subgroup, then all right, it sits inside the big one. And G slash H, if G starts as finite, G slash H is also smaller. And the intuition is somehow it will be easier to study H and G mod H because those are smaller groups. And somehow if you can sort of weave the information that you get about those two groups together, that you could somehow conclude something about the original group G. So the idea is if I have a group that's not simple, that I can somehow study it by building it up from these pieces, the piece H and G mod H, which presumably are, simp are, are simpler, right? easier. Simple intuitively means you somehow can't break it down any further. If there's no normal subgroups, then the group that you're handed, you're sort of stuck with. You can't do this sort of breaking down process. To. So you can almost think of the simple groups as the groups that you're going to have to use as the building blocks to describe all the other groups if there's some chance of using this breaking down process. So it would be of interest to sort of know what all these look like. So here's a big question. Question, are there more? The answer turns out to be yes. I'm not going to describe them for you, though. This is what we'll call an infinite class of simple groups. So there's infinitely many on this list, even though they sort of come up in the same way. It's just the even permutation sitting inside the group 1 through, through n. Uh, there are some other infinite classes, just like the alternating groups are, classes of simple groups. There's some what are called sporadic simple groups. Uh, simple groups. In other words, <laughs> groups that just by, I don't know, good luck or bad luck, depending on your outlook on life, I guess, just, I mean, there is one. There is one with 168 elements, or here's one with a, you know, like, like almost 10 to the 34th number of elements. And there's some small ones and some big ones, but there are some simple groups that don't sort of follow some sort of pattern. So here's the sort of gigantic question, big question, can we somehow describe all the simple groups? And let me put one disclaimer in there, all finite simple groups. Is it possible to come up with a list saying if you have a finite simple group it has to be on this list? Well, the list admittedly would be infinite, because I've already written down infinitely many simple groups. There's infinitely many there, and there, it turns out there's infinitely many on this list. turns out there's a couple of more lists that are, 
that contain an infinite number of groups, but they're all sort of the same structure. And then there's some that don't. So this was a huge question that the mathematical community worked on for about 50 years. Because intuitively, these somehow describe the building blocks for all groups. And for a while, people thought, well, this is just too big a project. And you know, how could you ever hope to get your, your, not only your head around it, but how would you hope to be able to say, if I start with a simple group, that it has to be one on this list? And by the mid-60s, it turned out enough work had been done on this question that people thought, you know what? We might actually have a chance of getting to an answer to this thing. We don't really know what the answer is yet, but if we sort of keep working and sort of going down this road and looking for some more examples and doing a little bit of stuff in geometry and doing a little stuff with sort of finite structures, maybe we'll be able to get a handle on what more of them look like and eventually hopefully get some handle on where they all have to be. And eventually, the answer turned out to be Yes, done. It's not clear when victory was really declared, but there was one gentleman named Dan Gornstein who was at Rutgers who sort of acted as the clearinghouse for all this stuff because there were literally hundreds of mathematicians working on this question, each working on a little piece. And you know, they'd sort of get a little piece and then they hand that little piece off to someone else and they sort of modify that little piece and see where they got. And you know, there'd be a big push to say, oh yeah, in the end, here, I've got another simple group. Or this thing that I was looking at that has all the makings of a simple group turned out to not be simple, or turned out to be a simple group that we already know, something like that. And eventually, by about 1985, it sort of all congealed. If you look at the literature, all of the work that was done to try to establish this list of all finite simple groups takes about 10,000 pages in the literature. I mean, just there's pieces everywhere. And you might say, well, you know, why bother? Or who cares? And that's a fair question. But in the end, I think it's a, I mean, it's a testament to people sort of focusing on a question that was of interest. And B, it turns out there's been some nice consequences of knowing where all the simple groups are. You're able to, to sort of get a handle on how it's possible to build other types of structures, not just groups. Some crystallographic type constructions have come out of these things. And uh, you know, mathematicians sort of looked at this proof as, well, this is a, a, a testament to just working hard. It's sort of the, the Mount Everest question that people eventually were able to put together. There are a couple of mathematicians now that are working on taking this sort of you know, massive Uber project and trying to distill out of it some sort of a more streamlined or more intuitively clear understanding of why it is that all of the simple groups look like the following things. I think, and don't quote me on this, I think there's five infinite families and 26 sporadic groups or something like that. Why is that? I mean, it's just unbelievable that that answer could even be achieved. And then it's a question of, well, how do you go about determining that this really is everything in the list? Uh, along the way as well, it turned out, and this I think is what drove a lot of mathematicians to work quite hard on this particular project, that there were these totally unexpected connections made between the structure of groups and many different structures that were coming up in other areas of mathematics, like in geometry or in crystallographic stuff or in coding theory, et cetera, that when the group there started looking at these structures, they started saying, yeah, you know, this numerically looks like something over here. Or there's too much numerical coincidence between the structure that we're looking at here and the structure that you folks are looking at in what seems to be a completely unrelated field. There must be some connection. And they started working on the connections. And not only were they able to establish a connection, but by sort of understanding what the groups brought to the table, it gave information about the geometry. And vice versa, what the geometers had already known about the structure, they gave some information about the groups. So there was this really nice sort of back and forth that was happening between many different disciplines and the finite group theorists. Okay. There was a really nice article written in Scientific American by Dan Gorenstein, who, who died in the early 90s. Uh, he wrote a, a, a SIAM article that you folks should read. I've posted it on the uh, course website. I've posted a link to it. It's, I don't know, 15 pages or something like that. It's certainly aimed at a general audience. But now that you know what a group is, and you know what subgroups are, you know what normal subgroups are, and you know what factor groups are, et cetera, I think that article will really make a lot of sense to you. So I would strongly recommend, if you're looking for some I don't know, bedtime reading or something like that, you can 
<laughs> download it or I don't know, take a look at it. It's pretty. It's pretty fun. I mean, it's, it's just compelling the way that this thing played out in the end. So. Okay, uh, let me just uh, for the last ten minutes talk a little bit about this word that we've been using almost since week one in here. What it means for two groups to be isomorphic. And what I've been doing is playing up this word from an intuitive point of view. Isomorphic means that the two groups that you're looking at have the same structure. So isomorphic. And the way we've been so playing that up is if you write out the group table for one of them and you write out the group table for the other, if you simply somehow relabel things by some common language that the two tables really represent the same sort of structure, that's what isomorphism means. And that's the intuition that, I'm, uh, that I've been hoping you to develop. Well, now it turns out we can actually write down the technical definition of what it means for two groups to be isomorphic. The definition of isomorphic means that there is a nice homomorphism from one group to the other. And if you think about it, homomorphism is a function from one group to another group that somehow preserves structure. And if in the end that homomorphism turns out to pair the elements of the two groups up in a one-to-one -one and onto or in a bijective way, then we're going to call the homomorphism an isomorphism and we're going to say that the two groups are isomorphic. So the definition is that the two groups, well, let me start with the definition of isomorphism first. Um, a homomorphism phi from one group to another is called an isomorphism. An isomorphism. So that's the word isomorphism. Notice that the two endings are the same here. In case, well, this is just a function requirement, phi is both one to one and onto. Or in slightly higher falutin language, phi is a bijection, one to one correspondence. So homomorphism, a homomorphism is an isomorphism in case as a function it happens to be both one-to-one -one and onto. Oh, we can actually measure when it's one-to-one -one in terms of the kernel. So this happens if and only if the kernel of phi is just the identity and phi is onto. Phi is onto. There's no real good subgroup measure of whether or not a homomorphism is onto in terms of any sort of you know, easy test. But at least we have that for one-to-one. -one. So that's what an isomorphism is. And then the second word is isomorphic. We say the groups G and G prime are isomorphic. And we've already used that phrase this semester. Here's what it means technically in case there's an isomorphism from one to the other. There exists an isomorphism. phi from g to g prime. So two groups are isomorphic in case you can get from one to the other by an isomorphism. In other words, by a function that preserves the structure in these things, that's what homomorphism means, but that at the same time simply pairs things up in a one-to-one -one and onto way. That's a bijective correspondence between the elements. And if you think intuitively, that's exactly what it should mean to say that the group tables of these two can simply be relabeled to some sort of common table where they look the same. The relabeling process is simply what your isomorphism does. If you've got this thing relabeled to something else, then simply ask, well, if you've got a common relabeling, what is this relabeled to and what is that relabeled to? And then just match those up. Then match those up, match those up. That'll be a one-to-one -one and onto. In other words, a bijective correspondence, but it's something that preserves the structure. In other words, that labeling will, in fact, be a homomorphism. So here's a pretty interesting question. If I hand you two groups, can you determine whether or not they are isomorphic? whether they have the same structure. Well, up until now, the test was simply to try to write out the group tables and see if you could somehow come up with some sort of correspondence that made the two tables look the same. 
Or, conversely, you look at the two tables and say, you know what, there's something about these two tables that inherently makes them not isomorphic. And for example, when we looked at the group, let's say Z4, and this group that we've been calling V, well, inside Z4, it was the case that there were elements that when you did the binary operation to themselves, you didn't get the identity. Like inside Z4, if you do 1 plus 1, you get 2, which isn't 0. But inside the group V, if you ever do the binary operation on an element to itself, you always got the identity. So those two couldn't be isomorphic. You couldn't somehow relabel these to get these because over here, whenever you did A star A, you got E, and over here there were things such that A star A wasn't E. Okay. So question in general, if somebody simply plops two groups on the table in front of you and says, are they isomorphic or not? That turns out to be a relatively hard question. I don't know. So what you do is, and oh yeah, this will be perfect, last five minutes here. I mean, this is sort of philosophy then about mathematics. So how do you answer this question? Well, if you don't know the answer to begin with, if it's a yes, no type question, you sort of push one way and see if you can get an answer. And if you can't, then maybe start pushing from the other way and see if you can get an answer. And then, you know, hopefully you sort of squeeze what's left over till you finally get an answer, at least from yes, no. So, you know, here's two groups. Are they isomorphic? Well, you could maybe try to answer no just by looking at some general principles. Like if I hand you a group with five elements in a group with eight elements, can they be isomorphic? No, because to be isomorphic, it means there has to be an isomorphism from one to the other. In other words, if nothing else, there has to be a one-to-one -one and onto function from one to the other. And hey, if there's a one-to-one -one and onto function from one set to another set, it means the two sets have to have the same number of elements in it to begin with. So if I hand you two groups and they have a different number of elements, immediately they can't be isomorphic. Out. All right, so a somewhat more interesting question. Here's two groups with eight elements. Can they be? Well, are they isomorphic? Well, your sort of gross level hope fails here. They have the same number of elements, so they could be. So your first sort of filter fails you. All right, now you've got to look a little bit deeper. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Okay, well, what we develop is a list of things similar to the number of elements where if one group has it and another group doesn't, then they can't be isomorphic. If this has five elements and this has eight elements, they can't be isomorphic, just for function reasons. Let's see. If this group is cyclic and this group is not cyclic, then they can't be isomorphic. Why? Because if this group has a generator, then regardless of how you relabel the elements here, the other group that you relabel it to is always going to have a generator because this thing, it's a generator over here. I don't care what you call it, it's always going to be the case that when you keep combining it with itself, you'll get all the other elements. So if you have a cyclic group and a not cyclic group, they're not isomorphic. If you have an abelian group and a not abelian group, then they're not isomorphic. If you have a group that has, let's say, exactly two elements with the property that when you combine them with itself, you get the identity, think of it as if you have a group with the property that x star x equals e only has two solutions, maybe e and one other thing, that's true in Z sub 4, for example. And you hand me another group, and there's maybe three solutions to that quote-unquote equation, x star x equals e. Then the groups are not isomorphic. Think, because all the things that we've been talking about, cyclic versus not cyclic, abelian versus not abelian, the number of solutions to things that look like combine an element with itself to get the identity, all those things are what we call structural properties of the group. They're things that don't depend on how you label the elements. They're things that are inherently true about the elements in the group, independent of how you label them. And those are typically referred to as isomorphism invariants. Isomorphism invariants. And I'll just list a few out for you here. For example, uh, being abelian is an isomorphism invariant, meaning if you hand me two groups, one which is abelian and one which isn't abelian, then the two groups are not isomorphic. Being cyclic is an isomorphism invariant. Uh, the number of elements is an isomorphism invariant. Uh, the number of solutions to an equation of the form x star x, you know, x star x star star x equals E, where I've handed you a fixed number of elements, maybe M elements here or something like that. 
is an isomorphism invariant. Let me give you an example of this. For example, here's two groups. Uh, the group of non-zero real numbers under multiplication and the group of non-zero complex numbers under multiplication. There's two groups. Are they isomorphic? Well, they're both infinite and they both look like multiplication. You might say that one sits inside that one so they can't be isomorphic. Well, oh yeah. being a subgroup of doesn't preclude two groups from being isomorphic. What you'll show for homework, for example, is if you look at the group of integers and you look at its subgroup consisting of multiples of four as groups, those are actually isomorphic groups that have the same structure, even though one sits inside the other. How do I know that? Because it's pretty easy to write down an isomorphism from one to the other. It's the function that simply multiplies everything by four. So being a subgroup doesn't preclude this one from being isomorphic or not isomorphic to that one, but it turns out they're not. Let's see, how many solutions are there to the equation inside this group? How many, ooh, wait a minute, let me do one better here. If I do x star x star x star x equals e, let's see. So how many elements inside the non-zero reals have the property that when you raise them to the fourth power you get one? two elements in there. Here they are. One and minus one both do this. How many elements in here have that property? Four of them. One and minus one do, but so do i and minus i. So because the number of elements that are solutions to that completely binary operation inside the group equation, since those two numbers are different, these are not isomorphic. So not isomorphic. You know, what happens sometimes, which makes things a little bit harder than you'd hope, is sometimes you go through this list of isomorphism invariants and they're all still matching up, but it's maybe not clear how to write down a function from one to the other that behaves as an isomorphism. And that's where the, I don't know, interesting questions come in. Okay, here is home. And again, this will be due on a shorter turnaround time, due Monday, a week from today. Excuse me. Uh, let's see what's that, the 22nd. Uh, in section 15, problems 1 through 5, I want you to do 2 and 3 to turn in, but uh, change the instructions at least just slightly to, let's see, number 1, uh, compute the order of uh, each of the elements of the factor group, element in the factor group, just like we did in class for the first 15 minutes or so of tonight. And then secondly, answer the yes-no question, is the factor group, goes that group, cyclic? Yeah, that's what I want you to do on those two. Then a question to turn in, uh, prove if G is cyclic, and H is a subgroup of G, then the factor group G slash H is cyclic. I want you to turn that one in. And then finally, let's see, in section three, it's a question about isomorphisms, problems 29 through 33, I want you to turn in 33 parts A and B, and uh, on these two questions, actually write down, actually produce the isomorphism. Produce the isomorphism. The way the book asks the question, it's simply a yes, no question. Are these two groups isomorphic? Well, I want you to either say yes, and here's why, because here's the isomorphism, or no, because here's an isomorphism invariant. And I want you on 33B to change the following change um, C dot to C star dot. In other words, I want you to put a star there and change H dot to H star dot. Remember, star means non-zero elements of 
this author does things a little bit backwards. He talks about isomorphisms in the context of binary operations, not necessarily in the context of groups. For what we're interested in, I'm more um, concerned that you understand what isomorphism means in the context of groups. So back here, he looking at two, two different sorts of structures, neither of which is a group, but if you throw out the zero element, then you do get groups, and that's what I'm more interested in.